So before we get started on a lecture, um, I just wanted to remind you all your midterm is due tonight by 11.59 p.m. You know, it goes so fast, doesn't it? Uh, do 11.59 p.m. tonight if you haven't already uploaded your exam. Um, preferably in Word um, document or PDF format that's easier to open. Um, if I can't open your file, though, I'll let you know. Usually I can. Uh, so again, the exam is due tonight by 11.59 p.m. If you run into technological difficulties, just let me know. Right. Any questions on that? Okay. So, last class, um, we talked about um, political participation, why people vote, why they don't. Um, and today we're going to start talking about parties. I don't mean the fun kind with tequila, I mean political parties. Um, so we're going to talk about um, the types of parties we have, some of the changes we've seen, and how parties are basically run, um, how they kind of function. Okay. What are parties, um, political parties? Essentially, they exist to try and influence the government. They are kind of the middleman. They run the people who want to run the government. So they're trying to control the government by getting members of their party elected to office. And for some people, they are going to have a very strong sense of partisanship. Um, Maybe you strongly support President Trump. Maybe you are a big fan of Joe Biden. And how you look at debates and media coverage is going to be shaped by that a bit. Um, and the parties understand this. The parties realize that this can happen. The parties are our point of contact. If we don't like what our government is doing, they can vote the other guys in. If you're not happy with what the Republicans have done in office, they can choose to vote Democrat. Um, if you are happy, you can choose to vote Republican. It's basically how we have a say in government, is by choosing which party is in control. And we do need parties. We need them to exist because we need fair competition. We need to have a real choice. If this was a one-party country, there wouldn't be much debate, discussion, excitement about elections. Um, so we need parties to give us a real choice, to have the ability to influence what our government does. Um, there's more incentive to show up to vote if you really care who's in charge of the House of Representatives or the Senate. The parties are necessary. Um, we need them to give us choices, um, to be able to hold our leaders accountable. But they are also rightly criticized for being too polarized. Because Candidates do rely on campaign contributions. Um, the parties really have become, in some ways, too focused on interest groups and the wealthy. Um, you got to run for re-election. You're going to respond to the people who helped you out in the last election. That's just the nature of the beast.
there are other countries that have a one-party system. Botswana in South Africa has only had one party since independence. Um, the people can only run under one party. Now, there is some competition on who gets to keep, but it's not the same. So, where political parties have been shaped and reshaped over time? Parties are formed and changed through internal and external mobilization. Internal is when the party in charge starts to have some fracturing, um, starts to have some conflicts within the party. And this can happen during a war or an economic crisis. So the Tea Party, for example, um, came about because of the collapse of the economy in 2008 and the by very conservative Republicans on what they saw as too much spending and not enough um, opposition to the spending by moderate Republicans. So there was this fracture between moderate and conservative Republicans, um, and some conservative Republicans ran as Tea Party members rather than strictly Republicans. There's also external mobilization. When a party or a politician who's not currently in government will try to find a way to get people to support them. Um, the Republican Party is the result of the anti-slavery movement. They understood that protests would only get them so far. To form a political plan a serious challenge, now you so the Republican Party is because of the abolition movement that they were able to organize a formal party and win an election. The system does have some problems. It is a two-party system. While there are Greens and Libertarians and Socialists, etc., Democrats and Republicans are the only parties that ever have a real chance to win. It discourages people from voting third party. It also makes it harder to run as a third party candidate. Bernie Sanders was criticized for running as a Democrat, even though he's actually a social Democrat. He couldn't run as an independent because he would never fit anywhere, right? He was forced to join the Democratic Party. Criticism shouldn't be he became a Democrat because he didn't have any other choice, realistically, if he wanted to get anywhere. And that's also problematic, and we don't like the candidates. If you don't like Trump and you don't like Biden, who are you going to vote for? Now, you could vote third party, but it's not really going to make a difference, right? Then most people look at that and say, well, I might as well stay home because. I don't like either one of these people, and I don't see the point in voting. It also doesn't help that our system is basically set up so that you don't have to win a majority of the vote. You just have to get the most votes. If you could win office with 38% of the vote because you got the most votes. It's not a majority system. And there's no consolation prize for coming in second. You don't get a seat in Congress for coming in second. Right? There's no second place award. You win or you lose, and that's it. I may have asked this already, but I'll ask you guys again out of curiosity. How many of you would vote for a third party candidate if they actually had a shot of winning? 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, so she would as well. Yeah. It would be nice to get rid of this two party system because there are times I look at both parties and I'm like, it's what? Someone else in here? Okay. So you need people to run for office at every level. And so one of the key things that parties have to do is get people to run for office. We want people who are loyal to the party and to its basic ideology to run. They also want people with a strong leadership record. Someone well respected. Also, someone who can raise their own money. The parties can't pay for every single candidate. So if they have to give you a couple million dollars for your campaign, that's a couple million dollars that's not going to another candidate. If you can't raise the money, you're not likely to get your party support. It can be hard to get people to run for office. Who wants to have their entire life scrutinized and thrown back at them? Who wants people going to your high school and saying, did they ever cheat on a test? Talking to an old boyfriend or girlfriend. It does discourage some people from voting, or, the, uh, or from, sorry, from running. Why would I run if I'm just going to get dragged through the mud? So you do have to raise a ton of money. If you want to run for the house, you're talking at least half a million dollars easily for a non-competitive election. For the Senate, between 10 to 30 million dollars, depending. And for president, well, we better bring in the big bucks. In 2012, President Obama and Mitt Romney spent a combined $4 billion in the election. That's the GDP of some countries. And we're talking huge amounts of money here. It does somewhat limit the number of candidates, right? You have to be willing to go through the gauntlet. You have to be able to raise the money. You kind of have to have your own money to start the process. So it can be hard to find candidates. Also, sometimes if you scrutinize your opponent too much, that can come back to fight you. In the 2004 Illinois Senate race, when Barack Obama was running, his Republican opponent was a man named Jack Ryan. And Jack Ryan, for whatever reason, decided to hire a guy to take a video camera and follow Obama everywhere he went. But the guy had just been filming his campaign speeches and stuff, flying that's opposition research. He actually filmed his family from outside of his house. He's basically stalking um, then State Senator Obama. And then the voters found out that Jack Ryan had a past record of infidelity and spousal abuse with his ex wife. So he had to drop out of the race. And it's like, if you hadn't opened the door, you know, you wouldn't have had to drop out. You put that much scrutiny on someone else. Better not be hiding anything yourself. Candidates to run, but of course, in a general election, you only want one candidate running for your party. So we had three Democrats running for a House seat. Um, it would fracture the vote and give it to the Republicans. It came to light when they nominate multiple people from a TV show or movie for an award. Right? The likelihood that that candidates or that 
um, actors than a wind goes down a bit. So the parties only want one candidate running in a general election to prevent this split voting problem. So they'll discourage people from running as independents um, or mounting an opposition campaign. We use a system of primaries and caucuses to uh, choose the candidates. Um, Iowa is a caucus system. It was a nightmare this year. It's not usually that bad, but it went very badly this year because of problems with these. Um, it's a, um, a primary. That's easier. That's cheaper. So you need the backing of the party. Um, it helps if you can get endorsements from people higher up the food chain. Um, you need major funding. Part of the problem with that is if you're relying on the party, you have to toe the party line. You're not going to be as independent. Um, you're going to have a very rigid partisanship. And the parties need to get people out to vote. It's one thing to say you support a candidate. It's another to show up on election day. Um, so they have to get people out to vote. And they'll use nonprofits and community groups like Walk the Vote, um, the League of Women Voters, and others. Doing things like um, providing transportation from um, senior care facility to the poll. Uh, going around to college campuses and helping students find their polling places, things like that. And they look at a database with over 240 million potential voters. And they look at things like census data, consumer information, voting history, try and determine how people vote. If you're someone who's voted every election, are more likely to get targeted by the parties. Um, pollsters are probably going to want to talk to you. In every campaign, there's at least one group that the parties decide they have to go after because they can make the difference in the outcome of the election. In 2004, this was the so-called sucker mom. Uh, the woman with her minivan, her 2.5 kids, and the dog. Um, the idea being they're going to focus on suburban moms. They're worried about um, security and terrorism and things like that. Usually, both parties will look at a group and try to target them to get them to show up to vote. Uh, evangelicals, young voters, minorities. It will vary from campaign to campaign and from election to election. Um, for the presidential elections, every four years, both parties hold a national convention. Um, obviously, this year, because of COVID, the conventions were largely virtual. Usually, they pick a city like Boston or Milwaukee or San Francisco, and they hold their party's convention there. It's at this convention that the presidential candidates and vice presidential candidates are formally nominated. Where we will say or see um, someone saying um, the Democratic Party is pleased to announce Joe Biden as their presidential candidate, something like that. 
Prior to World War II, because there wasn't the widespread use of primaries and caucuses, conventions were really important. Because uh, that was where we found out who the party nominees were. There was a lot of voting, horse trading, compromising. Nowadays, we usually know who the nominee is prior to the convention. Um, and this is true in most years. So the element of surprise isn't necessarily who the presidential candidate is going to be, but who they're going to pick for VP. And usually they don't announce until about a week before the convention to kind of keep it a surprise. There is sometimes discussion on the party platform. Um, the Democratic Party platform will include language like we believe that um, abortion should be left up to a woman and her doctor or something like that. The platform's largely ignored by voters and the presidential candidates don't talk about it very often. It's on the party's national website like the Democratic National Committee and Republican National Committee. Most people don't really look at that. They're not necessarily going to pay attention to what the party platform is. They're more concerned with who's running and what are they saying. Again, the conventions aren't super exciting. They're not dramatic television. But there are a few exceptions. And the 1968 Democratic National Convention is one of those very rare exceptions. In 1968, there are three men running for the Democratic nomination. Um, Robert Kennedy, who was the brother of President John F. Kennedy, um, Hubert Humphrey, who was the former, who was the vice president at the time, and Senator Eugene McCarthy. On the night of the California primary, which Bobby Kennedy won, he was shot and killed in the kitchen, and then it became a question of, well, what now, right? Because your party's presumptive nominee is now dead. Um, obviously, this is a problem, right? They, they weren't sure how to deal with it. So there was a fight in the convention. Some of the delegates said, let's give it to Ted Kennedy to run in his brother's place. Others said, we have to give it to McCarthy because he had the second most votes. And the third faction said, well, let's just give it to Humphrey because he's the vice president. On top of that, you had massive anti-war protests outside the convention in Chicago that led to riots, violence, and a lot of nastiness. Um, it was a very, very ugly, ugly convention. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a short clip of what this actually looked like, because it was pretty damn bad. Draw attention from the convention to the streets. Every 
very involved in the peace. He read the term force to keep the peace. He was glad of at least 5,000 National Guards, 7,500 regular army troops. <laughs> Right. It, it went very, 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 very badly. It cost the Democrats the election. Because um, the American look at the very peaceful Republican National Convention, the absolute disaster that was the Democrats, and voted for Richard Nixon, the law and order. So it's not usually that ugly, but it was in 1968. Um, it was it was pretty bad. Okay, so there are um, national political committees, the Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee. And so they're involved with fundraising, trying to resolve disputes within the party, and working with the media, um, putting together the image of their candidates, sharing what they think about um, current issues, etc. And so the funding comes from a couple of different methods. Hard money is money that is given directly to a candidate by us. If you donate $50 to Joe Biden, that's hard money. If you give the money to the Democratic Party, that's considered soft money. The soft money goes to the parties rather than the candidates. Um, and it's not regulated as long as they're not directly coordinating their actions with the candidates. So the DNC and the RNC raise and spend as much money as they want as long as they aren't coordinating their activities with the candidates necessarily. Um, and to deal with money, both committees have set up what's called a political action committee or a PAC. Um, these are called 527 organizations. Um, and essentially, they can raise and spend as much money as they want as long as they aren't directly coordinating their actions with the party. So we've all seen those ads. That will say something like paid for by citizens for Donald Trump or paid for by um, citizens against gun laws. Um, and they do have to say not affiliated with any candidate or party. So again, as long as you're not directly coordinating with the party, there's no real restrictions on the money. There's also a 501c4. These are politically active organizations that have nonprofit status. The rules are different for nonprofits. You can set up a nonprofit that's politically active, 
as long as it isn't designed to raise money. If you could create a nonprofit to increase voter registration, but you couldn't create a 501c4 and say, well, our purpose is to raise money. No. The 501c4, because it is a nonprofit, is considered dark money. They do not have to disclose who donates or how much. So there's a lot of money that goes into campaigns that we have no idea where it's coming from. There's the national parties, but of course you also need state and local offices and branches of the parties. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, the local politics were strongly controlled by what were called party machines. Um, they were famous in cities like Chicago, Boston, and New York City. They controlled who ran for office. Um, we got to be part of the city politics. Um, there was a lot of bribery, a lot of corruption, a lot of violence, um, not a particularly pretty time. And they would also essentially bribe people to vote. Um, they would say, if you vote for our candidate, we'll help you get a job as a firefighter, police officer, or sanitation collection person. Um, very high paying jobs at the time. Also things like, oh, you're a recent immigrant, we'll help you get your citizenship if you vote for our candidate. And my personal favorite, handing out free turkeys for Thanksgiving in exchange for votes. I love that one. Um, once we started having more primaries and removed some of that um, machine control, some of the corruption was taken out. Um, it gave candidates the ability to run without having to provide someone permission. Um, party machines exist in some form, though, in places like Chicago. For something like 50 years, it was once one family that controlled the mayorship. Um, the Daly family went from father to son to grandson. Um, it was a bit ridiculous. So what we see now with the parties is more voter registration attempts. Um, getting people to run. Getting people to run for all levels of office. Um, city council, school board, state legislature, and so on. Um, it's not as sexy, it's not as glamorous, but someone's got to run. Um, so they're constantly trying to get people to a board to say, I'll run for railroad commissioner or city council or mayor. Mm -hmm. 
The joke in Chicago politics is vote early, vote often. Or Chicago, where dead men vote. Okay, any questions or comments? Um, so, how do the lay people decide which parties they're going to support is by looking at their policies? And this is just very broadly speaking what we see in current party policy. The Republican National Committee tends to favor strict immigration laws, high spending for the military, um, tax cuts, less money for welfare, um, food stamps, or Medicaid. They tend to oppose abortion and same-sex marriage. Keep in mind, again, this is broadly speaking. Uh, there are pro-choice Republicans. There are Republicans who support same-sex marriage. Um, this is just a general party policy. The Democratic National Committee wants more funding for welfare, education, um, Medicaid, etc. Less spending the military. Higher taxes on the wealthy. Environmental protection laws. Um, the party platform does consider itself pro-choice, but of course there are pro-life Democrats um, as well as Republicans. Based on these policies, um, we see Democrats trying to get um, poor people, minorities, young voters, and liberal professionals to vote Democrat. Um, but Bill Clinton, during his tenure as president, where they tried to get some of the middle class liberals um, to show up and support the Democrats. Republicans try to appeal to white working class voters, uh, military families, religious and social conservatives. It was during the Reagan administration that Southern whites left the Democratic Party and became Republicans because of his opposition to abortion, his support for prayer and school, and his opposition to affirmative action. Um, so we've seen the parties kind of shifting how they try to bring people in. And they will try to create policies that will appeal to the public in general. Tax cuts are a pretty popular policy for Republicans. Uh, people don't like paying taxes, so you offer tax cuts. That's pretty popular. Um, Democrats talking about more funding for education, that tends to be pretty popular across the board. So we'll try to create policies that appeal to the independents as well as to members of their base. Um, Reagan originally, and then yeah. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Yes, he did. Um, I mean, generally speaking, Republican t- candidates will talk about supporting religion in schools. But they know the Supreme Court has struck down Bible readings and prayer and things like that. So it's kind of an empty gesture. It's them saying to religious voters, we got your back, but we can't do anything about it because that's up to the Supreme Court. But yeah, it, it's early with Reagan. It's a, it's a placating kind of thing. But Trump saying, oh, we should have Bible readings in public schools. I mean, you can't, he should know that the courts have struck that down repeatedly. It's not like it's going to be like, well, it's not my fault, it's the courts. If I had my way, this wouldn't happen. It's a bit cynical, but it's also just a ploy for votes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so when the parties are in office, there are some things that we tend to see happening. Um, the majority party is the party that has the most seats in the House or the Senate. Currently, Democrats control the House of Representatives, while Republicans control the Senate. And it's the majority party that picks the leadership. Um, so the leadership is the Speaker of the House and the President pro temporary of the Senate. We'll talk more about those two offices when we get to Congress. It's usually just a simple majority party vote. So the current Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi. And the current president pro tempore of the Senate is Mitch McConnell. That may change after November. Um, if Republicans lose the majority in the Senate, we may get Chuck Schumer as the new president pro tempore. If Democrats lose control of the House, it will go to someone else. Um, in terms of the committees, both parties are given a certain um, number of seats on committees. And they both tend to use a seniority system. Um, the higher up you are, the longer you've served in office, the better your committee choice. If you're a freshman Congress member, you're not getting on the House Armed Services Committee. Um, if you look at things like seniority, um, Republicans have been better about party building, especially when they are an office of Democrats. Democrats tend to focus on legislation and um, re-election that used to cost them a lot. When they lost the 2004 presidential election, um, Howard Dean became chair of the DNC and he started focusing on party building. We see a little bit more of that now than we used to. But because of the high partisanship, we do tend to see representatives going strictly along party lines. Um, and there was that vote to impeach and remove President Trump. Pretty much all the Democrats voted yes, all the Republicans voted no. The Affordable Care Act, um, the only reason it became law was because Democrats had a majority in the House and the Senate. The legislation isn't bipartisan really anymore, it's majority party rules and too bad for the other side.
and also if you're wondering why the whole Congress isn't putting anything on these days, it's because I don't have these things. Okay, let's terms of how we identify with the parties, it's fairly evenly divided. We got about a third of Americans identifying as Republicans, a third of Democrats, and a little bit more than a third as Independent. Independent is someone who doesn't feel a particular tie to either party. So may have voted for Obama in 2000, but then Trump in 2016. We'll go back and forth. Now, if you do identify as a Democrat or a Republican, it's usually a lifetime attached. It's pretty rare for people to switch sides. It really only happens if you're convinced that the party you belong to doesn't serve your best interests. Anymore. So if you're feeling like the Republicans under the Trump administration have abandoned you, you might switch your party affiliation. But it's pretty rare. Um, usually you pick one and stick with it. And usually you vote along partisan lines, especially in what's considered down ticket races. You're going to know a lot about who's running for Senate, House, Governor, President, but not necessarily um, state courts, uh, city council, um, things like that, right? Because there's just not as much information. So people will look at the party identification and vote along those lines. Also, if you are strongly Democrat or strongly Republican, you engage in what's called straight ticket voting. You walk in early voting or on election day, at the box that says vote for all Democratic candidates, vote for all Republican candidates, hit submit and you're done. Right? If you're someone who's like, I'll never vote for candidates of the other party, you can just check that box and you're done. If you're more of an independent, you're going to go back and forth and you won't straight ticket vote. And for people who do give their time and money and effort to the party, they are more partisan. Democrat Party activists are more liberal than Democrats. Republican Party activists are more conservative than most Republican voters. It's part of the polarization effect. Um, you get people who say um, Donald Trump is the greatest president, and people who say Donald Trump is the con man who belongs in jail. Right? And neither side can be convinced to change their opinion on it. Um, and then the people in the middle are just sitting here going, what the heck is going on with you guys? In terms of party affiliation, um, more than 90% of African Americans identify as Democrats. They used to identify as Republicans because of Lincoln and the abolition movement. This changed in the 1960s when President Johnson signed into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They switched from Republican to Democrat. 
Um, so usually Democrats can count on the African American vote. We are seeing Latino, Hispanic voters, and Asian Americans um, voting Democrat in larger numbers, partly because of policies on immigration. Um, but you can never 100% say this group is entirely Democrat or entirely Republican. Gender-wise, women do tend to vote Democrat more than men. Part of that is the issues. Um, women are concerned with issues like contraception, abortion, child care, equal pay. Men may be more concerned about defense spending, um, gun laws, the economy. Women do tend to vote Democrat um, in larger numbers compared to men. But again, you can't say all women are Democrats. That's not true. Religiously, 90% of Jewish Americans are Democrats. I don't know why that's the case, to be completely honest. Um, to go back to President Roosevelt in World War II, I don't really know, but they do tend to vote Democrat. Catholic lean Republican, although um, there has been some kind of split in attitudes within the church. It will be interesting to see how Catholics vote this time um, with Joe Biden being alive for Catholic. Does that make a difference for some Catholic voters? Maybe, maybe not. But it is an interesting um, question because he's only the second Catholic nominee for president in modern history. Um, and white and evangelical Protestants do tend to vote Republican. Um, do tend to be a bit more conservative. And people who aren't religious, well, they go based off of policy, right? In terms of income or class, um, wealthy Americans tend to vote Republican because of the party stance on tax cuts, um, business taxes, etc. Working class whites also tend to vote Republican. A little bit of a contradiction um, that pollsters can't quite work out, but they just, for a variety of reasons, vote Republican. Um, working class minorities tend to vote Democrat. Middle class Americans will split. Um, some Democrat, some Republican. Ideologically, conservatives vote Republican, liberals vote Democrat. Moderates, after. Um, some elections will vote Democrat, some will vote Republican, and some they just won't vote at all. We're seeing less predictability in voting. Um, more Americans are not identifying with a party. They're tired of the infighting. They're tired of the two-party system. They're breaking away from that traditional identity. It's harder to know which way an election is going to go. Region-wise, um, the South tends to be largely Republican um, because of the Bible Belt. Also, there's a lot of military bases in the South that are um, a huge boost to the economy, but so you don't want to see them shut down. Northeast and the Northwest tend to be Democrat. Um, Oregon, Washington, California, New York, Massachusetts tend to be a little bit more liberal. Midwest. 
pretty largely split. Um, Minnesota and Illinois are safely Democratic states. Missouri and Indiana are pretty safe Republican states. Um, Wisconsin is becoming a battleground state. Iowa, Ohio, Pennsylvania are battleground states. Michigan is up for grabs. Um, so we are seeing um, Biden spending a lot of time in states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio to hide that place. Um, Statewise, older voters tend to be Republican because of concerns about um, prescription costs, social security, uh, Medicare. Younger voters tend to be Democrats. Um, they're concerned with issues like the environment, student loan debt, cost of housing, etc. Again, this is broadly speaking. Um, obviously, there's lots of young voters who are Republican and a fair number of older voters who are Democrats. So this is just broadly speaking. When we look at the breakdown in elections, this is some of what we see. Quite frankly, this is one of these elections where I don't think anybody has a solid idea who's going to win. Um, quick and formal poll, how many of you think President Trump's going to win re-election? Yeah, how many of you think Biden might win? Yeah. Right? Yeah. In the end, it didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, they have no idea who's going to win. I'm not making any guesses. Um, I, I look at the polls and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's just, there's too much up in the air. Um, one thing I will say with relative certainty is I'm pretty sure we're not going to know who won on election night. There's too many mail-in ballots that are going to have to be used. Um, too many issues with perhaps longer lines than usual, especially if they are enforcing social distancing. It's going to take a while before we find out who won. Um, because part of the problem is, let's say, usually the rule is you have to have your mail-in ballot to the place before or on election day. But what if there's a mail delay, right? And yours doesn't get there until the day after the election. Well, if you mailed it before the election, it should count, right? But is it going to be counted? And so there's probably going to be court battle, legal challenges. Um, if it's super, super close in some states, there may have to be a recount. It could be a while before we find out who won. I'm not sure it'll be as bad as 2000, where it had to go to the Supreme Court, but it's possible. It's possible this election could also end up before the Supreme Court. But I'm pretty sure we're not going to know who won um, on November 3rd. It may take about a week. Yeah, Eileen, my anxiety is through the roof on this one, too, because it could be a damn long process. Um, 2000 with the Florida ballots, that was bad enough, but this this could be very bad. Um, I mean, unless it's an absolute blowout, which I don't see happening, there's no way it's not going to take a while to, to get this all sorted out. Um, there's going to be people on both sides who think the election wasn't fair or, you know, it's, it's just going to be a very ugly election. Um, Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's an interesting problem, right? What happens if Trump loses and he refuses to concede? We've never had that happen. Um, hypothetically, here's what would happen. If on Inauguration Day, President Trump locks himself in the Oval Office and says, you can't make me leave, technically, Secret Service, the National Guard could go in and forcibly remove him. Now, will it come to that? I hope not. But if he refused to leave, he could be forcibly removed from the White House. Hopefully that wouldn't happen because that's never happened. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully he'll. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him not to show up on inauguration day, but as long as he's not barricading himself in the White House, I think we could live with that. But uh, yeah, the idea that Secret Service might have to be like, all right, you're coming with us, sir. That not the image we want to be presenting, so hopefully that won't happen. But, yeah. We've actually had the UN has actually offered to send in election observers. And I'm not entirely opposed to the idea of having independent observers in major cities making sure they're not. I'm not opposed to the idea with this election of letting other countries observe us this time around. It's not the worst idea I've heard. Yeah, it's going to be a mess. Absolute freaking mess. It was funny because in 2016, um, day after the election, I went to a conference, um, a political science conference, and there was a whole bunch of people who were talking about their papers, and they're like, yeah, we've had to rewrite the ending of our paper since Tuesday because we all thought Trump was going to lose, so now we have to, like, rewrite it first. Which is kind of funny when you think about it. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of people holding off on writing anything about this election until it's completely settled. No idea. It could be, it could be very, very, very stressful. Um, so that's it for today. Just as a reminder, your midterm exam is due by 11.59 p.m. tonight in Howard. Um, if you have any technology problems or blackboard working, just let me know. Um, I'll try to have the exams graded within a week. It's usually my turnaround time, but if seven classes, it may take a little while for me to get to the grading. Um, it's going to be longer than a week, I'll let you guys know. Um, you do not have to write the question in the essay, Eileen, but um, it would be helpful if you would listen as one, two, three, four, so I know which question you're answering. Um, basically, just turning in pages, um, page to a page and a half per question, level spaced, 12.5. Separately, um, that's about it. Um, yeah, you, you don't. Okay, yeah, that's fine, Eileen. Um, you don't have to include the question. You can, if that helps. But you don't have to. Um, just number your answer so I can see which question you're, you're answering. Um, if you directly cite from the book or the notes, yes. Um, if it's just paraphrasing, no. If you use something other than the book or your notes, you do need to cite it so I know where it came from. Um, these are really, really good questions. Any other questions? Okay. Um, the good thing about turning them in online is once I've graded your exam, you'll be able to do it for graded so you're not waiting a weekend. Okay, my grade. That's my grade. Yeah. Um, not that that was me as an undergrad or anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll wrap up parties next Tuesday. Um, so you guys, of course, will be online to read the second half of chapter nine for Tuesday. I'll make sure I get your exam by the end of the day. Um, if you came in after I took attendance, you can see me for a minute. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on.